Okay, so we do have some kids in the room, and I want to ask for all of you little girls. Who in here is a little girl? Can you raise your hand if you're a little girl? Okay. Um, if you're a little girl, I want you to put your hand down now, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands again if you have ever thought about your future wedding day. A few, a few. Have you, if you're a girl, have you ever thought about the dress you're going to wear on your wedding day? Yeah, a few of you, some of you, okay. If you're a girl, have you ever thought, have you ever thought about the dude that you're going to be hitched up to on your wedding day? You know, the, the guy, the Prince Charming. No, it's all about the wedding and the dress, not, a, not about the guy. Um, one last question. If you're a girl, have you ever thought about being a mommy and having a little, a little baby that you can rock? And Yeah, there's a few more. Okay, um, now, if you are a boy, have you ever had any of those thoughts? <laughs> Except for the dress thing, I hope. Um, that's another story. But have you ever thought about the tuxedo you're going to wear? Nope. I mentioned this on Sunday. I said that the, the time the guy proposes to a woman is the last decision he has to make. You know, he, he decides how to propose and that's the end. You know, everything else after that, she just gets to make the decision all the way through the wedding. That's because she's been planning it since she was five. That's because she's been thinking about it since she was five. Since the first time she saw Cinderella and decided whether or not she wanted the puffy sleeve or the not puffy sleeve dress. Because if you're familiar with Cinderella, in all of the Disney princess pictures, she has one kind of sleeve, and in the movie, she's got a different kind of sleeve. Why do I know that? Mm, you'll have to find out sometime about uh, maybe someone that I know who wore one of those dresses once. But anyway, you have to make those kinds of decisions. If you're a little girl, you're planning on that. You're thinking about it. It's part of your, it's part of your life. You know, you grow up, you watch these girls with the dresses, and you even watch the TV show say yes to the dress. It's all part of the female girl culture somehow. Tonight, we're going to talk about a woman who, when she was 14 years old, had her wedding dreams shattered, absolutely ruined. And if you have a Bible, flip your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2 tonight, and I want to read to you, uh, starting in verse, actually, let's go back to Luke chapter 1. Let's start there. We're going to read to you some stuff in Luke chapter 1, then we're also going to hit Luke chapter 2, but uh, this is going to be interesting. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, the verse is going to be on the screen as well. Let's go ahead and read them. It says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth is a lady who was mentioned earlier on in Luke chapter one. She's another lady who got pregnant uh, by a miracle. But in the sixth month of her pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now, the story of Mary and the angel has been very popularized, especially around Christmas time. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. You've heard it a lot. And it's always popularized in this kind of sense. The angel here comes and speaks to Mary. Mary hears the angel. And then at the end of this conversation, Mary is like, yes, may it be to me as you have said. And she's like this this really wonderful human being who's really all excited about this miracle that God is going to be doing in her life. And you have to know the real story. Now, I'm not saying that she wasn't that, but I'm saying that before she got there, she might have been somewhere else. Because you need to know that the women back then 
were usually betrothed, they usually got engaged when they were 14 years old. So that means Mary is about 14 years old. When they refer to her as a virgin, that word virgin can also mean young woman. Now, particularly when Luke uses it, it also means what we understand as virgin. And so here it's talking about her. She is a young woman. She's probably about 14 years old and she's engaged to be married. Now, that's the first thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is that um, for a woman in her age, uh, that engagement process was pretty significant. There were rules that went along with that engagement process. The rules that went along with uh, what it meant. And I imagine that for her, she was thinking through all of those rules, trying to make sure she kept her rules, trying to make sure she was ready for that day when Joseph would finally come and marry her. And it would be fully official. She was engaged. She was young. She was anticipating, I imagine, that wedding day. There are a couple other things you need to know about that society. One thing is a blank. You can actually jot down if you have the note sheet or you can just tap it on the screen. But it's this. Women were nothing if they weren't married. So she was 14 years old. And in her society, women were nothing if they weren't married. They couldn't own property. They couldn't hold a job. They couldn't do anything because they were considered by society to be not worth anything. It was being married that gave a woman their sense of identity. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's the way it was. And so for her, getting married is becoming a person, basically. Everything relies on it. I don't know what kind of dresses they had back then. I don't know what kind of ceremonies they had back then. There's some Jewish ceremonies today that maybe harken back to that, but we don't know all the details. But I do know this. She was looking forward to that wedding day because it was going to give her identity and status in the society. And there's something else that was true about women in the day. Back then, women could be killed if they were pregnant without a husband. Women could be killed if they were pregnant without a husband. That's huge. I mean, that's gigantic. For those of you kids in the room, let me just tell you this, okay? See, God has made a decision that only that when there's a mommy and daddy does a baby get put in the mommy's tummy, okay? Only when there's a mommy and daddy does a baby get put in the mommy's tummy. And here in this case, an angel comes to Mary and says, it's just you, girl, there's no daddy. And she goes, what? How's this happen? The only time God ever made that decision. The only time God ever made that decision. And now she's walking around and she's got a baby. She's got no daddy and she's definitely not pregnant. I mean, she's definitely not married. And on top of that, God had a rule back then. God had a rule that said if a woman was pregnant and she wasn't married, kill her and whoever's the dad. That's crazy. I mean, so here's Mary. She's talking to an angel. And that's why the angel says, by the way, don't be afraid because this was serious. Okay, this was serious. The angel comes and he says, you're going to be pregnant. And Mary says, um, how's that going to work? And the angel says, God's going to do it. And Mary goes, okay, but still, how's it going to work? When I'm walking around and I got a bump and, and there's, there's Joseph and he's supposed to be marrying me because after all, if people think he's the dad, they're going to kill him too. And everything was destroyed. All of her hopes all of her dreams, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to work. That's just not the way it's supposed to work. She's supposed to be betrothed. There's supposed to be a year of getting ready. Then there's supposed to be a wedding. Then there's supposed to be a cake or whatever they do back then. Then she's supposed to get pregnant. Then she's supposed to have her kid. Then she's supposed to become a mom. This is not the way it's supposed to work. And it's all that angel's fault. Or maybe it's God's fault because he sent the angel. But this is not the way it's supposed to be. If you flip over to Luke chapter 2, you then begin to see the next part of the story. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius were governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. That's not the way it's supposed to be. See, 
The voice of the government says you need to go to Bethlehem. Why? Because we're going to tax you. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Number one, that's not the way it's supposed to be because they've got a nice home in Nazareth. They do. See, Joseph is such a great guy that when he found out that Mary was pregnant because of an angel, he decided he was going to go ahead and marry her anyway. When he found out that God was doing something special with Mary, he decided to marry her anyway. And so they got married. They had a nice little home in Nazareth. She's pregnant, and Joseph decided he was going to just nurture her and take care of her. They've got a nice little home, and now the government says, no, you got to go to Bethlehem. That's not the way it's supposed to work. They're supposed to develop a home together. They're supposed to develop their family together. And now they're supposed to go somewhere completely different, go to Bethlehem. And if that's not all, it's not supposed to work this way because they're Jewish. God is supposed to be in charge of the Jewish nation and the Jews are supposed to be in their own country, right? But now the Romans are taxing them. That's not the way it's supposed to work. And beyond all that, babies are supposed to be born at home. And she's pregnant and she's going to be going miles and miles away to this foreign land, Bethlehem, just because Joseph's ancestors were from Bethlehem. And just because some of her ancestors were from Bethlehem. So she has to make this whole trip to get there. That's not the way it's supposed to be. If you keep reading the story, it doesn't get any better. Verse six, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because There was no guest room available for them. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Now, some of you I know have a different translation, or maybe you memorize this in a different translation where it says there was no room for them in the inn. I mean, that's the most common thing. So let me just stand on a little bit of uh, church history soapbox for a moment, okay? Just give me a second. Okay. So here's the deal. There was no inn, okay? For those of you who are little kids in the room and you're hearing this for the first time, trust the Bible, don't trust the TV. There was no inn, because back then, in that time, there were no such things as Motel 6s, or anything like it, because the only places where you would go and spend money to spend a night are places that good people don't go to, okay? You don't go someplace and spend money to spend the night. There were no good inns back then. Instead, Joseph and Mary just went to their family relative's house. But see, what you need to know about peasant houses back then is that they were designed in like a donut shape. And in the center of the donut shape was sort of like the common area. And then on top of that, there was a second layer where the people would live. And then down below that in the dirt common area is where all the animals would stay during the night. Some houses were in a donut shape, some houses were in a stair step shape. But the lower level was the animal level, and then the upper level was the people level. That's the way the peasants lived. They didn't have enough money to keep their animals outside because they couldn't build any fences or dig into the cave systems or anything like that. So the animals were lower level, the people were upper level. And any guest room they might have had would have been on the upper level. And so here's Joseph and Mary going to their family's residence, you know, their hometown, Bethlehem. They're going to relatives' houses, but every other person who's their relative is also there. Some of you are going to be at a big family event tomorrow. And imagine having to spend the night in the same house with all them people. Now, I I know that that's going to be a little tough. And in that day, all of those people took the top levels, and Mary and Joseph were left to put the baby in the manger in the bottom level. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be is that the woman who's pregnant gets honored. The woman who's pregnant gets the soft bed. The woman who's pregnant gets the nice place to stay. It's not that they drove too long and got there late. It's not that the no vacancy signs had already been turned off. It's none of that. It's that they've been there for a little period, period of time. I don't know how long. And no one gave her the nice place. That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's just not the way it's supposed to be. And that's not what mangers are for. This was inconvenient for Mary. This was also inconvenient for the animals. They're going to eat. There's a kid there. (laughs) What do we do now, Bob? I don't know. Eat around him. (laughs) That's not what mangers are for. It's just not the way things are supposed to work. Let's keep going. 
In verse 8, we pick up another story. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. That's not the way it's supposed to work. I mean, moms are supposed to have time to just be with their babies and rest. Moms are supposed to have some time to just rest with their babies and not deal with smelly shepherds. And here they are, the lower level of this place, the baby's in a manger because that's the best place they had for him. Knock, 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 can we come in? And a whole horde of shepherds, I don't know how many of them there were, my guess is maybe five or six, but who knows, there could have been 20. I hope not, because that would have been a mess. But, and what happened to all their sheep? They just leave them out there? I don't know. But anyway, so the shepherds show up, they knock on the door, can we come in? No, you can't. Because there's a lady in here who's just given birth. Now, I don't know about you, but um, when my wife gave birth to both of our children, no one entered that room because she didn't want them to enter that room. And grandma and grandpa came by and there was, a, there was an exception made for them, but no one else came in that room. I needed to ask permission too. So that's the thing. That's the way it works. The mom should just have some time to be with the baby to rest. And now here are these shepherds, smelly shepherds, nasty shepherds. And you have to know the shepherds of this day were like social outcasts. They were so messy, dirty, nasty, and weird that they were not allowed to participate in any religious stuff. They were the outcasts of the day. And they knock on the door and say, can we come in? And they come in. And it's not supposed to work this way. Nothing about this entire event worked the way it was supposed to work. Silent night, nothing goes right. That's the problem here. I mean, the entire time, Mary's hopes have been dashed. You know, and as you think about this, I want to ask you a question. How many times have you said about a situation that's not right and then decided to do something about it? Decided to take matters into your own hands? You know, because at any point in this whole story, Mary could have done that. The angel says to you, you're going to have a baby without a daddy. And she goes, uh, no, not going to do it. Sorry, find another girl. I'm just not interested. I'll pass on this one. I've got plans. No, she could have said that, but she didn't. Every step along the way, the government says, go to Bethlehem. She could have said, no, Joseph's the head of the household. He's the only one who needs to go and represent our family. I don't need to go too. They get there, and now they're staying at the bottom level with all the animals, and, and she could have said, no, 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 I'm pregnant. Give me the upstairs, and all y'all go downstairs, leave me alone. She could have said something like that, but she didn't. She could have said, no manger will see my baby. But she didn't. Something about this whole situation, she could have taken steps to stop this, everything's going wrong. But she doesn't. And yet, you know what I do? Every single time something disappoints me, I try to fix it. I try to solve it. I try to find my way around. I try to come up with some other plan B or whatever. And Mary just says, may it be to me as you've said. And what God brings into her life, she's willing to just accept. Let's read the end of the story. Just three more verses, beginning in verse 17. When the shepherds had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
You see, what Mary does, she doesn't choose to oppose all this stuff. She chooses to treasure and to wonder. To take the things, lock them up, put them inside, just hang on to them. She doesn't know what they mean. She doesn't know the significance. All she knows is she's going to hang on to this stuff and she's going to keep wondering about it. And I imagine over the years, as she wondered, she began to see things in a different light. I imagine eventually she found her way to Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9, where she would have read these words. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." He had to be born of a virgin. The promised Savior had to be born of a virgin. I imagine at some point Mary came across Micah. And in Micah chapter 5, she would have read verse 2, which says this, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. See, the promised ruler had to come from Bethlehem. He had to. And then if she kept reading, she would have gotten to the very next verse, which says this, Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. See, the promised king had to be like a shepherd. Somehow he had to have the heart of a shepherd. And then I imagine eventually Mary would have gotten to Isaiah 57, which says this, For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And see, this promised one, if he's coming from God, he needed to be all about the kind of people who hang around a manger. Nothing, to Mary's perspective, was working the way it was supposed to. Nothing was the way it was supposed to be. But you know what? I imagine as she pondered this, and even if she never got it, we should get it, that even though everything seemed wrong, it had to be that way. Even though everything seemed wrong, that is the way it had to be. It had to be. And so how many times could she have said, that's not the way it's supposed to be, and try to find a different angle? But no, she's just willing to treasure, she's just willing to ponder, and at the end of the day, it all comes out that's the way it had to be. Listen, Christmas, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, is a time for a lot of disappointments. Just today, I found out that a friend of mine, uh, a fellow pastor in town, he's not a lead pastor, he's a worship pastor in this town, his dad died today. They knew it was coming, that doesn't matter. It's still a loss. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. So much of our life is that's not the way it's supposed to be. And yet, Sometimes the thing that is not the way it's supposed to be has to happen that way so that the thing that we all want to be actually happens. And that's what this is all about. And you know what? This lesson that Mary learned, that sometimes when everything seems wrong, it's exactly the way it needs to be, that lesson would have served her well 33 years later. Because there, became, there came a moment when Mary would spend her last few minutes watching her son die and see him get buried in a tomb and think that's not the way it's supposed to be and think that's wrong. But you know what? 
in the clarity of Easter, in the clarity of the moments after she has seen him alive again, then she could say that thing that seemed so wrong was so right. And the thing that I thought was bad was so good. And the thing that was not the way it was supposed to be was exactly the way it needed to be. And so I ask you to hang on to hope. Because see, Christmas is a time when we realize that there's a bigger plan. Christmas is the time when we realize that God is really in charge. And Christmas is a time when we realize that if God did something and brought Jesus into this broken world, then he can bring him into this broken world again. And he can take what's broken and he can finally fix it. And ultimately, I want you to jot this down. All of our bad can be turned to good if Jesus is involved. All of our bad can be turned to good if Jesus is involved. This Christmas season... I want you to claim this promise, that what God started in a manger, he will finish on a throne, and that what seems bad is for your good, and that our wrong can be turned to good as long as Jesus is involved. Thank you for listening to this message from Lafayette Community Church. We believe that God has a full and fulfilling life in store for you, and we want to help you live it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Pastor Jeff, through the web form at lafayettecommunitychurch.com. And as always, I encourage you to plug into a solid, God-honoring community wherever you may be. Life is a journey, and no one should ever walk alone.